So I'm going to talk about the Bambi plague um, a little bit. Uh, I, I've not studied Bambi in the Pittsburgh parks. I have studied it extensively in West Virginia and the Allegheny National Forest and the Monongahela National Forest. Um, in fact, one of my collaborators, Henry Schumacher, is sitting in the back. Um, but I've worked a lot with uh, Dr. Alex Royo with the Allegheny National Forest, um, Dr. Beth Adams with in Monongahela as well. Um, so that is how I feel about deer. Even our, our daughters are, are no longer safe. Um, so I want you to ponder that because that's how lots of uh, wildflowers feel, I assure you, and uh, seedlings and saplings of, of many of our trees. So deer are overabundant across just numerous areas of, of the eastern deciduous forest. I'm going to make a case to you um, this evening, uh, hopefully a compelling one, of the harm that deer do to our forests. But this one has been well made by forest ecologists and foresters for 20 or 30 years. There are at least three or four major scientific review articles on, on this topic. But historically, deer were thought to be, and these are our, our educated guesses, about 8 to 12 deer per square mile. Historically, when you had Native Americans hunting deer as well as mountain lions and wolves, um, we created very good habitat for them, removed their predators, and so they are now overabundant in, in many locations. So in, our, in Frick Park, I want to return um, again. So, so anything in red here means we have a heck of a lot of deer. Um, and one thing to note, no, Ohio did not put a fence up between Pennsylvania and West Virginia. <laughs> that, that tells you that they managed here very differently um, in Pennsylvania, West Virginia uh, versus Ohio. Um, but if you take a look at, this was uh, surveys done of deer populations in our parks. The Frick Park is probably an underestimate because of the snows stopped them from getting into their cameras. But 42, 82, and 62 are anywhere from four to eight times what we think historical abundances were. Remember, all deer do is eat, survive, reproduce, eat, survive, reproduce, and they do that every day of the year. And even though they're generalists, they have strong preferences. So the first thing that they remove from their habitat is the food that's most nutritious, and then that species is gone, followed by the next one. By the next one, um, I'm going to tell you what Bambi can do um, to eastern deciduous forests. It can make sparse native species become invasives, and I'll provide you some of the evidence for that. Create what I call the big green lie. Actually, I, I had the Allegheny National Forest personnel came up with that term, the big green lie. It can make it so we can defy one of the few solid ecological laws that we have can make plants grow out of rock, and it can contribute to failed oak regeneration throughout the eastern deciduous forest. So this is what I call um, making a, a natural, a native species, uh, an invasive, and it can create what we have called in published papers on a recalcitrant understory layer and what's easily called a triple whammy. Um, essentially what happened in the Allegheny National Forest, a certain amount of logging opened up the canopy. Um, this fern species used to be 3% of the cover of an understory in the ANF. Right now, this fern species forms this layer of vegetation in about 60% of the Allegheny National Forest. We call it a triple whammy because it's got a closed canopy above it that reduces light. The fern layer then reduces light to levels that are what you would find in the understory of a tropical rainforest. And then on top of that, that fern layer creates a haven for voracious rodents who are seed and seedling predators. So for any seedling or sapling to push through that layer of fern, um, it has to get through this triple whammy. Now, what happens is deer do not eat this fern. It spreads by rhizomes, basically underground clonal connections. And so you open up the canopy, the deer remove pretty much everything else, this fern spreads out, and then makes it very, very difficult to regenerate a healthy forest. The way they now regenerate healthy forest in large parts of the Allegheny is they fence for a while, they spray herbicide, unfortunately, over large areas to remove that fern or they can't regenerate a healthy forest. And then they allow that forest to regenerate in the absence of deer. You can imagine how expensive that, that process is. So the big green lie. Beach bark disease has started in New England, has spread through the killing front, has come through the Allegheny National Forest. It causes 85 to 95 percent mortality of adult beach. But the juveniles, the saplings, aren't vulnerable to beach bark disease. And these are not saplings that came from seed. From seed. They are clonal. They came from root sprouts. So the beach bark disease kills the adult, 
and then that sends hormonal signals to the root mat below to put up these clonal root sprouts, and we develop a very, very dense understory. Beech casts the second most deepest shade of any tree in the eastern deciduous forest after hemlock. So the light levels in the understory of this clonal group of root sprouts is very low, creating what you see there, very low diversity in the understory. As these root sprouts become larger saplings, the bark starts to split. A scale insect that's introduced that spreads beech bark disease will get in and cause mortality then of these saplings once they get larger. We can't get the evolution of resistance because these are genetically identical to the adults. So we, the reason we call it the big green lie is there have been pictures of wonderful regeneration in the Allegheny National Forest in newspapers in north central Pennsylvania saying, wow, look at this great regeneration, look at this lush forest we're regenerating, when in fact they're clonally identical root sprouts that will become vulnerable to the beech bark disease. Boulder tops have become refugia. Where do we find lots of species of wildflowers growing in the Allegheny National Forest? They grow on what some, some of us have called, and we've published papers on this, rock refugia gardens. These boulders, deer can't get on top of. So I said, how is it that deer can make it so um, wildflowers will grow out of rocks? This is an example. And my forest ecology class has, has gone and climbed on top of these boulders. And my students have published a couple of papers basically documenting this impact. So if you look along the y-axis on the left side, that's species richness, simply the number of wildflower species. Each dot or square as you move across on the x-axis is a different boulder that we climbed on. Now we climbed on tall boulders that the deer couldn't get on top of, small boulders that deer could climb on top of, and then the soil surface. Why do deer defy an ecological law? These are called species accumulation curves. As you sample more area, you add species. The top line is the line of the tall boulders. So as we sampled on top of each additional boulders, we kept finding new wildflowers and we got up to about 25. And there are 50 to 75 wildflower species in the Allegheny National Forest. You can see what happens when deer are overabundant. Remember, the deer in the Allegheny National Forest are not as abundant historically as the 70 and 80 per deer that you have per square mile in some of the Pittsburgh parks. They have flatline diversity. So what happens if we go to long-term exclosures? About 60 years ago, a guy named Latham set up, uh, he worked with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. He set up a one-acre fenced exclosure. It's been maintained for 60 years. Um, we have a paper that just is in press now that will be published in the next three months. Um, again, on the y-axis, you can see percent cover. We just went out, my forest ecology class went out, simply estimated the amount of cover, of total cover of wildflower species, ferns, and shrubs. And the white, we call it the Latham plot. Um, in fact, that is inside that fenced exclosure that has excluded deer. And about 45% of the surface layer of the soil is covered by wildflowers. Um, the ferns were pretty equal between the two. The deer don't eat the ferns. And then shrubs were essentially locally exterminated. So you would walk through that fenced exclosure and there would be a lush layer of wildflowers and shrubs. Outside of that exclosure, there was not. And I think that the evidence here is compelling. Um, that's looking, this isn't the Latham plot, but that is looking inside a fence exclosure and outside of an exclosure in the Allegheny National Forest. So that is a bonsai beach in the Allegheny National Forest. Deer don't really like to eat beech. It's low in nitrogen, it's not very nutritious, but when there's not a lot uh, else there, note the fern all around it, that's hay-scented fern, Denstedia, the deer will come in and repeatedly um, consume the beech, creating what we call these bonsai beech. So what can deer herbivory do over the long term? This was work done by Tom Rooney, who's now a professor at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Again, on the y-axis is simply the number of species of, of wildflowers. On the x-axis, this is from the Hearts Content area of the Allegheny National Forest. He went back to surveys done in 1928. He was able to relocate the exact 
plots. They found the old wooden stakes that a forester had put out in these plots in 1928. He found them, resurveyed them, and said, okay, how many wildflowers do we have now? You can see the data. The white graph is from more recently, 1995, where we found 27 and 42 different wildflower species at each of two types within the heart's content. And then you can see, I'm sorry, that's from 1928. And then we go down to 11 and 8 species in 1995. So again, over a very long time frame, you can see what overbrowsing has done. Um, this is work actually that Henry Schumacher did, who's in the back in the audience here. Henry went out and surveyed 19 old growth forest fragments, remnants that had not been logged. And there's only 12 of these reported here. And this is a somewhat complex graph, but the bar graphs on the left side are the oak trees growing in the canopy. The middle graph, each one of these 12 graphs is a different old growth forest outside the oak wilt zone. Um, it's a big arc through um, north central Pennsylvania. So each of these represents a different old growth forest. The left bar is what's growing in the canopy. The middle is what's growing in the sub canopy, sort of large saplings. And the understory is on the right. There's an absolutely clear picture here. Oaks are not regenerating in any of these old growth forests. None of the species are. And a big chunk of that is likely due to overbrowsing by deer. So I want to get into a little bit to ecological theory here, bear with me, but I think it's important to understand what causes forests to change over time. So we have three models that describe this, and they're really trade-offs that species have. Species can be fire tolerant, they can be shade tolerant, or they can be browse tolerant. It's hard to do all of those things. So I'm going to go through this fairly rapidly, but the key is that shade tolerance has historically been how we have understood forest change over time. All of our models of future forest canopy composition depends on the fact that species and saplings in the understory are highly shade tolerant. The species in the overstory typically are less shade tolerant. Big tornado comes through, wipes out, causing a stand replacement disturbance or you have logging. Fast growing pioneer species come in first, the shade tolerance follow. So we can divvy up species on a continuum. On the left side are species that are shade tolerant. Many of us know what they are. They're the beeches, the sugar maples, the hemlocks. Go to the far right side of the graph. This is a continuum. Virtually all tree species align somewhere along this continuum. And we can, I'm not going to go into this, except other to say that hardcore data, actually this was a group out of Princeton University, have been able to divvy up species. Um, again, on the y-axis just simply shows species that can grow very fast. They're up in the top left. Species that are very shade tolerant in the bottom right. And this is a nice continuum. It effectively and typically can predict future canopy composition. In a little while, I'm going to show you when deer over browse, this model no longer works. So we can now have the mammalian browsing model. How do you make it into the future canopy? The only way you make it there is you're very browse tolerant. Deer are coming through, they're browsing you before a big disturbance, they browse you after. If you're not browse tolerant, you're not gonna be there, you will never make it to the canopy. And we can do the same thing. We can divide up species along a continuum. Are you browse tolerant? Are you, are you not browse tolerant? Typically there's a trade-off. Those species that grow fast have nutritious leaves that deer like to eat. Slower growing species are typically, not always, but typically better defended. So the other critical thing that drives forest turnover is fire. Either you can be tolerant to fire or not. And I'm not talking about crown fires that you think of out in the west. What I'm really talking about are understory fires that came through forests, even in this area, anywhere from every 15 to 70 years. They would go through the understory, they would clean it out. The species that survived that fire were the fire tolerant ones, and I don't have time to go into the details of that. I bring it up because these are what we think are the main drivers of what causes forests to change over time. So, and again, the fire tolerance model simply means some species are fire tolerant and some species are not. And again, we can divide species up along a nice continuum and we have good empirical evidence for this continuum. So we've had fire suppression policies for a very long time, the Smokey the Bear campaign. Um, really has removed fire um, from much of our landscapes. 
So how do we decide which is the critical driver? Is it the fact that we've suppressed fire? Is it shade tolerance or is it over browsing by deer? We went down to West Virginia um, to the Furneaux to, to work with the U.S. Forest Service and my colleague Beth Adams, and we tried to do a critical factorial experiment to address that question. What I want to show you here is business as usual over much of the eastern United States, over many parts of West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Again, each color in this graph represents a different tree species. On the far right side is the canopy. Those species are up in the canopy and you can see many colors. As you move to the left, we move to smaller individuals. So SAPL simply means saplings in different size classes, and on the left side are seedlings. It's very clear, you lose colors. If we go to many parts of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, New Jersey, this is business as usual. We have a nice diverse canopy, and we have a low diversity understory. Why is that? So we did the experiment. We went down to West Virginia. We went to eight different large stands. These were about 80 to 100 acres. We divided them half, flipped a coin. We burned one half, and we didn't burn the other half. You can see the fire and the no fire. Then we built a fence to exclude deer in both sides. We then cut a canopy gap. We knew that lots of species were shade tolerant. We know that light limits growth in the understory. So we wanted to study the main drivers. Was it browsing, was it fire, or was it light availability? And we ran, we've run this experiment now, we're in, in more than 10 years. So this just tells you we followed lots of individuals. In fact, we've probably tagged about 40,000 trees and followed them for a very long period of time. So what was the upshot? Um, and the, the, there's a, a lot of complexity to this, but this graph conveys most of it. On the, white, the, the, the y axis, again, on the left side, is simply the density. How many saplings are growing, and that's per hectare, about two and a half acres. On the x axis is each of these treatments. But there, and again, each color represents a different tree species. Note where, in fact, you have a very small bar. The small bar always has deer browsing. Um, so we have a gap. We went out and added a lot of light to the system. Do we add more species? Do we get more growth? No. The deer were there. We burn, we give the system a really good kick. If we don't exclude deer, we get low diversity, low density stands. However, if we go back and put these disturbances, fire back on the landscape, canopy gaps that naturally occur, we can regenerate a very healthy stand. What does that mean for Pittsburgh parks? Well, we have what I like to call the ghost of herbivory past. What happened when we had a control that was what was happening out there? And then we have no deer. We build a fence to get rid of the deer, and very little happened. The reason is that the deer have driven vulnerable species to almost to, to abundances that are so low, once you get rid of them, very little happens. You really have to kick the system. What's happening in Pittsburgh parks now? We are going to have emerald ash borer come in, remove about 17% of the trees. It's going to be, create huge light gaps. What's going to be able to respond to those light gaps? most likely invasive plant species because they are less vulnerable to deer than our native species. So this is what's going to happen if we leave deer abundances the way they are in our parks. The co combination of emerald ash borer and over browsing is going to lead to low diversity to pauper it stands here in Pittsburgh. So this is just visually on the left side is a fire gap without deer browsing down in the Monongahela. There's the right side. We went in, we burned, we kicked the system, we added light to the system. Nothing happened because the fern simply spread out. There was nothing there, very little there um, to respond. We get low density, low diversity stands. So the take home message here is that forest ecology worked. The shade tolerance model, if we get rid of deer, I didn't, I didn't explain that, but if we get rid of deer, the way we think forests change via the shade tolerance model works very well, but with over browsing it doesn't. You essentially have only browse tolerant species remain in your system. Essentially, deers rule the forest, and what we have, I'll return to this slide, um, we are creating forests that on the left side are dominated by a small number of tree species. In many cases, although not here, in many cases, those are going to be beech that are going to be very vulnerable to the return of beech bark disease. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you.